Hey, welcome back to Overhead Athletics. Max Wardell here. Today we're gonna to talk about labral tears. This is gonna be one of the first videos in a series about labral tears in the shoulder. This video is gonna be about tear type, and prognosis. We did a similar series on the ulnar collateral ligament that did very well. We see labral tears in a lot of our throwers. Honestly, maybe one of the most popular injuries or the most common injuries that we see coming into the clinic and one of the most popular questions we get is, how do I rehabilitate my labral tear to get back on the field after an injury? So this is the discussion of that in relation to our overhead athlete population. Couple things to consider. The first one is the location of the tear. Depending on where the tear is located, and the magnitude or how big the tear is is gonna determine in large part how difficult or realistic a full return to sport is for you as an athlete. The labrum itself, and I'm holding a shoulder joint here, clavicle or collarbone on the front, shoulder blade on the back, sits on me just like this. And we have the upper arm bone known as the humerus. And it's a ball and socket joint. Some people have likened it to a golf ball on a tee in kind of how it's formed. But the socket is about that big in most, in most people. It's a little oblong shaped. Underneath the ball, as you get in here, you see this structure here. That structure underneath, it's basically a cartilaginous disc that surrounds the shoulder. It deepens the socket, creates a concavity. So that actually creates the socket aspect of the ball and socket joint. That's known as the labrum, and it's a cartilage that's similar to the meniscus. It's a little bit rubbery. It's different than our articular cartilage that's on the surface of our joint, which is a hard, hyaline cartilage. And it's responsible for absorbing some shock, but also keeping that ball centered in the socket. We have three primary structures to keep the ball centered in the socket. And the first one is the labrum. The next one is the capsule, which they've tried to show on this model here as this material that surrounds the shoulder. It's a ligamentous attachment and it surrounds joints three-dimensionally. That's our second line of stability for the shoulder. And the next one is the muscular system, particularly the rotator cuff muscles. If any of those are deficient, the other two are going to have to do a bigger job or perform a bigger role to center that ball in the socket. Now, tear types. One of the most common tears that we see in our throwing athletes are slap lesions. Superior labrum, anterior to posterior tears. That occurs along the top aspect of the socket, as you can see here on the screen. There are multiple types of labral tear. This being the most common that we see in our throwing athletes is a slap tear or a slap lesion. There's multiple types of slap lesions. Some are more posterior or more towards the back of the socket. Some are more towards the front of the socket. Some are more on the top and sometimes it flaps down. Really what this is is a delamination or a tearing off of the labrum from the underlying bony surface, uh, the bony socket. We also have what's called a posterior labral tear, which differs a little bit because it's more located on the back side of the labrum. This can be particularly detrimental to throwing performance as the arm comes through the zone. Slap lesions seem to do better with conservative care than some of our other types of lesions to the labrum. Personally, I had a slap lesion. That's what brought me to the Overhead Athletic Institute first as a, as a patient myself. So very, very common. They often occur because that biceps tendon is pulling on the labrum because it actually attaches into that labrum, as you can see here in this image. Now, when we're looking at labral tears, we also want to talk about tears in the front of the socket, most common of which is a bank art lesion. These usually happen with dislocations. We see them in our baseball players when they dive into a base or when they dive to catch a ball. These types of tears are more difficult to rehabilitate but not impossible especially depending on how big the tear is what i tell everybody is no matter what type of tear you have it's always a good idea to get a second opinion about 70 percent of our professional baseball players are dealing with some sort of labral tear whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic so get a second opinion if your doctor is really quick to advise surgery for you. And surgery may be your best option, but it's good to get a second opinion and to look at all of your potential options as far as conservative care, because some of our statistics for getting back to play after labral reconstruction 
are not very favorable, specifically after a slap lesion. The, the statistics aren't great, and looking at about 10% of people ever make it back to the level they were at before their injury. So think about getting a second opinion there. Let's jump back to that Bancart lesion really quick. As you can see on the screen here, it's more on the bottom and the front of the socket, and it's an actual fracture of the glenoid, actually a fracture of the bone, as well as tearing of the labrum. This makes it really difficult for our throwers to access that layback position as they come through. So the big thoughts here, are smaller tears are gonna be much easier to rehabilitate, much easier to get back on the field without surgical intervention. Larger tears may take longer as far as conservative care, but may also have the opportunity to get back on the field without, without injury. I had a fairly significant labral tear. I was able to get back to throwing as fast as I was prior to my injury by doing the right things and stay, staying diligent with a corrective exercise regimen and stretching regimen as well as formal physical therapy and working on the mechanics of my throw, which is ultimately the most important component to getting back on the field after a labral tear. If you have a really large or extensive tear or a very significant fracture and bank heart lesion, that's one where you're gonna wanna get multiple opinions and potentially look at the prospects of a surgical intervention. We'll maybe do a, a future series on what to do if you've had surgery, labral surgery, but in this series, I wanna focus specifically on non-operative cases because these are what we're seeing more and more of and the literature is pointing us towards non-operative care for our labral tears in our throwing athletes. So that's what we'll focus on here. There's the primary types of labral tear. There are other forms and perturbations of what we just spoke about. The big thing is get your shoulder as strong as possible, which we'll show you here. Get into a corrective exercise regimen that focuses on end range strength, but also full articular range of the shoulder. We'll show you that in one of these videos here. And then we'll also go into throwing mechanics and some things to look at in your throw, but also some ways in which you can put your shoulder in better positions in your throw so you don't load your labrum in the same way you did that led to your injury. Majority of the time, athletes are able to get back on the field at their same level of play as they were before and often throwing even a little bit faster if they do things properly. Stay tuned for those next videos in this series. I'm Max Wardell. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe to the channel and we'll see you guys in the next one.